Hi, I'm Eshkelar, the world's greatest Canadian wizard. And as you can see, I am currently invisible. Yeah, it's like that, people. Fortunately for me, I have, in addition to my wizardly powers, which are not very useful here in this world of muggles, where there's no power in the standing magical field. I think it's like four kells per cubic knuckle here. It's very small. Uh, but in my... Uh, in my balance of powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, I also have certain psychic or psionic abilities, one of which, of course, is psionic invisibility. Yeah. So I'm practicing that because I'm going to need some compensation for losing many of my greatest wizardly powers in our world here, which I love because it contains Canada. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that of all the close continua this is the only world, this is the only continuum, the only pl prime material plane, as some people call it, that contains a Canada. So it's very special to me, because I am the world's greatest Canadian wizard. Huh? Some say I am the only Canadian wizard, and that would be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but uh, I have not yet eaten the sandwich, and I got a look at it the other day, and I'm probably not going to eat that sandwich. I don't think Homer Simpson could eat that sandwich, now. So anyway... I want to talk today about origin stories. That means I want to talk about other things. The physics that determine the world in which this origin takes place are extremely important or it may not happen at all. So, to talk about the origin of elves from my world, now from my continuum, which we, common, we survivors of it commonly call it the Westermark. So, the survivors of the Westermark come from a world our earth there is intensely magical there's no canada it's unfair but at any rate it's intensely magical the uh, kells per cubic centimeter count like here it's like five or six or not cubic centimeter cubic knuckle but the uh, it's like a centimeter and a half the um two centimeters but the kell counts per cubic knuckle in the western mark are like fifty thousand 75,000. Some places where the minerals are uh, closer to the surface, it could be 100, 200,000, which is so magical that the uh, radiation of it, the, the kelp field, the standing magical field is affected by, of course, and it causes uh, a lot of ionization of genetic material. So what happens is you get weird radiological mutations caused by magic, too much magic in the area. Except with magic, of course, it's pretty much quantified chaos so anything could happen you know you could grow a frog in your cheek you never know yeah you could turn into a dark monster of some sort often chaos turns into some kind of like eh, and you're sorry for it you know but not always some of the great monsters come from chaos so anyway to have an elf at least in our campaign you must have magic Elves like unicorns and some other fantastic or mythological beasts require a fairly high ambient Kel density in the standing magical field for good health and function. Below that level, they become sickly and they pine away as if missing some essential nutrient. That's why we don't see unicorns here in this world of muggles. That's because the Kel density is not nearly high enough to support it. That's why we very seldom see any magical effects, and that's why we have prestidigitation as opposed to wizardry. The big difference. Look them up. And also we have sorcery here, which is not the same as wizardry. If you need to, I will explain sorcery as a form of wizardry, as a form of magic use to you in another video. But for this one, let's just stick with the origin of the elves. To have elves, you must have magic. And to have magic, you must have a mechanism. Ask any physicist. So, there are, at this time, as far as I know from my divinations, there are ten standing quantum fields. That's a, a, a term of uh, extreme uh, energy and uh, particle physics. Uh, quantum physics. So, these 10 standing fields, when they interfere with each other, because each one has ripples in it, when the ripples like 
coalesce in the right place. I'm, not, I'm, do, I'm making like all kinds of motions here, showing you illustrations and stuff because I'm invisible. It's not coming through in the camera. It's a little unfair. I think I'll get a like an infrared, a thermal imager next, because then you can see me doing this. Because sonic invisibility is not so good against thermal imagers. Anyway, when these ripples in these various quantum fields are dense enough in a certain area, it achieves a manifestation, a proton, um, uh, a muon, a, uh, uh, a photon. These are what you might consider ephemeral phenomena that are only taking place because of this like external framework of the universe takes place and its interactions are interpreted by us because of our limited sensory ability as discrete objects and particles. But really it's all force fields and photons being exchanged between electrons and most of the universe is absolute empty space from our point of view. I mean, there is a concept that space abhors a vacuum and the basal tension of the universe expresses itself in the formation and destruction of virtual particles and every second, oh, it's, it's boring so. It's like they said, there is no chaos. Then they went, yes, there is. Because <sighs> chaos wins. Law tries to quantify things, and only so many things can be quantified. Chaos accepts everything, understands it, and says, well, no, that's the whole deal. You could ask me about dark energy. It's the aggregate effect of the acceleration of mass. That's all it is, you people. So anyway. Ah. <sighs> Getting back to elves. So, to be an elf, you must have a pretty responsible Kel density in the standing magical field. That's your, oh, by the way, I was talking about uh, uh, quantum fields. There are 10 of them known to physics. Well, there's an 11th one, it's called the standing magical field. I each of the quantum fields has a gauge particle. You know, like the photon is the gauge particle of the electromagnetic field. Yeah, which is the uh, the aggregation of the electro, uh, the electromagnetic force and the weak force. That's really the electro weak force, and it's very complicated and technologically advanced. And if you stuck your head in the observation deck, it'd probably be vaporized because the power of the beams they use to observe these effects are so high that I'm sure that they're continuing, they're contributing to global warming. How much energy is produced there at CERN, you guys? How much randomized energy is? cooled down by water, which is now a heat sink. And then you have to cool that down, which adds. You're releasing a huge amount of energy. So you're adding to the global temperature, right? I wonder what the percentage of that is. Probably infinitesimal. But I'm just curious, compared to, say, your average thermal vent at the bottom of the ocean, what's the difference in the energy being released? Because that affects the ecology. Yeah, it does. There's a three-eyed fish. I'm going to call him Blinky. I'm not going to eat him. Because when I put a bite on my fork, it crawls away. But, getting back to magic. To create magic, you need to have an energy source. To create any energy, to do any work in the universe, and magic does work in the universe, you need a mechanism by which it can do so. So, if you want to use certain kinds of energy, we have uh, the way to derive energy for doing work varies. One of these is chemical energy. You burn wood, the wood heats water in a, in a cylinder suspended over that wood, and that water being heated produces steam. You let the steam, because it's higher pressure than, than, than the air, it's not as high pressure as the water in the vessel, but it's higher pressure than the air in the vessel. And that pushes itself out into a pipe. And that pipe has pressure in it, and it, steam blows through that pipe until it comes to a pinwheel. And the steam blows on that pinwheel, and it blows, spins the pinwheel, just like spins the pinwheel. And that pinwheel is connected to a little armature. It's an electric generator. Yeah. And that's how we generate electricity on board. Used to, on board ships, locomotives. Yeah. And how many cities still produce their electricity is by heating up water, by burning fuel. And the water becomes steam. And the steam has higher pressure than the air uh, above the water that you boiled. <laughs> Just like in a kettle, blows out, has pressure. It wants to expand. 
and that is blown against a pinwheel. It's called a turbine. And that turbine, which is a, they have with jet airplanes too, it's a pinwheel. Yeah. That turbine. Uh, and it's a more dense form of the propeller for different reasons, but okay, kind of in reverse. Um, and that turbine spins an electrical generator. And that's how electricity is generated in many cities. You burn coal to make the heat, you burn wood to make the heat. Uh, for all I know, that's where they put the date expired soil and grain, too. They can burn that. Because, oh boy, is it burn. You know, uh, I have a reason for why that happens, but I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm talking about elves. And to talk about elves, you have to talk about magic. And to talk about magic, you have to talk about energy sources and work being done in the universe. And we call it here, it's called physics. Okay? So. You can't just get energy from nothing, really. If you could, wow, my horniness would power a city. So anyway, what happens is magic has a standing field, a quantum field. It's gauge particle, the thing from which you derive the energy from it to do work in the universe is called the Kel. So, when you have a high enough Kel density in the standing magical field, a suitably prepared human being can do work with that energy. Just like a suitably prepared human being could do work with the energy that's represented by wood and a spark and a tank of water. That's all the same as magical spells doing all that. Physics and magic are the same. However, in my universe, and in this universe too if it was younger, there is a, an additional standing magical field to the quantum fields. And from that, work can also be derived. And of course, some of that energy of the work is randomized. That's entropy, enthalpy, depending on what you're calling it, depending on what your profession is. Thank you, John Strain. Um, and to get this magic, just like to get heat, you have to break down existing materials. By, you know, like fire breaks down the, the wood chemically converts it into ash and uh, oxygen, free oxygen, free carbon monoxide, free carbon dioxide, you know, other byproducts, uh, particulates, uh, hydrocarbons, um, or hydro hydrocarbon residues. So, magic also is an energy source that is accessed by a certain mechanism. Just like burning wood creates heat, and you could use that to lift a hot air balloon. You could use that to boil water, make steam, and do just about anything after you make electricity from the steam. Uh, now, where does magic come from, though, as opposed to the chemical energy that we can measure that's already bound up in that wood or that coal? Well. Magic comes from the standing magical field. It has a certain Kel density. That Kel density is literally the amount of work that can be done in that area of the universe through magic. True story. So, now, the reason there is magic, especially in my old continuum and also in Patchworld, but not here, is due to the age of the universes involved. Because the universes are very similar around us, you know, the quantum universe is close to us, rather similar. But some of them are older and some of them are younger. And the younger ones tend to be more magical and the older ones tend to be less magical. Because magic is released into the standing magical field through the breakdown of certain elements. Much the same way that radioactivity breaks down certain elements and releases heat and energy and light. Various forms of energy we call heat and light and other stuff. Uh, by the release. Now, kels are very much like radioactive material. Well, not the kels, but kel emitting materials are very much like what we call radioactive materials. But instead of emitting bursts of neutrons, muons, huge amounts of photons, free electrons, protons, and fragments of other elements, when the materials that produce kels break down, they produce all the usual fragments, but also this additional binding energy it requires, because the, the, the nuclei are so large they require additional binding energy, uh, in Kells. And so they are released. 
So as you have radioactive elements, which have very high uh, atomic numbers and very high what we call nucleon counts, the combination of protons and neutrons, it takes a certain balance, what they call a magic number, to form a stable nucleus. And so when you have too many of one, either proton or neutron, or too few of one, either proton or neutron, you have an unstable nucleus. And the more unstable it is, the more likely it is to break down sooner. And that is what radioactivity is. Because when they break down, they release huge cascades of energy. You can measure in different ways. The kinetic, uh, the kinetic energy, the binding energy of the muons and the, and the lesser fragments and all the neutrons being released, I mean, all the uh, photons being released, of course, and the free neutrons and all. Well, Kelemitic particles do that too, but when they break down, they also release kels because they are the elements from which kels are derived bigger nuclei than the ones that produce the f familiar radiation that we know. And those are some pretty big nuclei. Uranium is the largest nucleus that I know of that stays stable for any length of time. And that's not all that long. And uh, some forms of uranium break down in 50,000 years, you know, in significant amounts uh, out of any sample. Some take 500,000 years or several million years. It depends on the isotope and how unstable it is. That's why we hear about U-235 and U-236 and U-238 because there's a difference in the nucleon count in these particular nuclei. Too many protons, too few neutrons, whatever. And that makes them unstable. Uh -huh. Each one is a different number. They're called isotopes. But they're still chemically like uranium. Uh -huh. So when you get above uranium to elements that are even denser than uranium with more protons and more neutrons and higher nucleon counts and higher atomic numbers because of the number of protons, you get into a place where almost nothing can be stable enough to be there. It just wouldn't form. It's just way too unstable. Too much energy represented. The protons will fly apart. The neutrons will create whatever, some other instability. Columbus suppression or something. At any rate, and these limits, where you can only have so many electron or so many neutrons or so many protons in every nucleus to balance it. So as you get more protons, you need more neutrons, and there are only certain numbers of neutrons per number of protons that will balance that enough to make a stable nucleus. Those are called drip lines. X amount of protons, X amount of neutrons. One more neutron, unstable nucleus. One more proton, unstable nucleus. This is how we get radioactive materials to work for us. One additional uh, proton we add to a piece of material and it like breaks apart real quick. Then releases a cloud of neutrons that fly into other uh, fragments and they you know, uh, create a cascade effect. The effect just goes and uh, it releases more energy than you put into it to start the effect. And that's a good thing. Fusion power, which we're told is around the corner, 75 years ago we were told it was around the corner too. And that's, I don't, maybe it is around the corner, who knows? Maybe it's a big corner. Maybe it's an Ouroboros and you'll never finish going around the corner. But fusion power is a different form of energy release. I'm dealing with radioactivity, which is generally, generally formed when you break down large nuclei from them being unstable and they break into smaller fragments. I guess I should say it's more common to us here on Earth. In the universe, fusion is much more common. We take, instead of taking one incredibly large nucleus and it wants to split apart, you give a little bit more energy and it splits apart, releases more energy than you spent breaking it apart. Instead of doing that, that's fission. Fusion is when you take two teeny tiny little uh, nuclei, hydrogen nuclei with like one proton, one neutron, and you bash them together. And you make them into a helium nucleus, an alpha particle with two protons and two neutrons. The, com the process is more complex than that. I'm just showing you endpoints, beginning and the end. In the sun, you create several kinds of uh, uh, elements along the way that break down again until you get that helium. You get uh, uh, 
I think it's called the carbon-carbon cycle because it involves carbon atoms as well. Anyway, you have these vastly larger nuclei creating these elements above the level of the uranides, uranium and its brothers and sisters on the periodic table. And even the transuranides, which are mostly, which are larger nuclei, but they're mostly created in laboratories. They're extremely unstable. They last fractions of a second. They really don't exist unless you're dealing with thousandth, thousandths, hundred thousandths, millionths, billionths of a second. These elements effectively don't exist. So, they got them on the periodic table, but it's more like, oh, I'm bored. What do you want to do with the equipment today? Hey, let's try this. We'll add an extra proton, extra neutron. Oh, look at where... Oh, no, it didn't. Okay, we developed a new atom. You know, so. But the atoms I'm talking about are way above those densities. The nucleides and the trans... Or the uh, uranides and the trans uranides. They're way above where a uranide might have a nucleon count, 180, 214, you know, whatever. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, uranium-236, 235, 238, that's the nucleon count. So 238 protons and neutrons combined in that nucleus. Where uranium only has 92 protons, no matter what form of uranium it is, no matter what isotope, all the difference between that and the numbers I'm saying are neutrons that it takes to make it stable enough that it doesn't right away fly apart. If there were just a few less neutrons, we wouldn't see any of it at all. And that's why these created elements in the laboratory, they don't have enough neutrons to be stable. They can't add neutrons enough to make them stable. There is no magic number of proton-neutron balance within the drip lines of proton number and neutron number that will allow them to stay stable. However, above, nucleon counts around 460. There are a few other elements that remain stable for over a billion years. 1.3 billion years for Ephodium, I think. Four billion years almost for um, uh, Hecat and Dominsk. Well, no, wait. Hecat breaks down into Dominsk, so Dominsk is very short-lived comparatively. We haven't seen it decay yet because it's young. The uh, uh, ephodium is fairly stable. Hecatium is fairly stable, but it's already breaking down into a, a lesser but still highly magical material called Dominsk. Dominsk is the most common form of magical mineral in my old campaign. You won't find it on Earth today because it's all broken down into lesser fragments. Just like uranium over time breaks down to lesser fragments, so do magical minerals but they release an additional particle. Whereas your, a uranide breaks down and releases uh, smaller nuclei, barium, hafnium, you know, bismuth, lead, whatever. And it releases lots of free protons and lots of free electrons. Well, lots of free neutrons and lots of free electrons. Should say, sorry, protons, mostly standard fragments. And the neutrons will blast into other uranium atoms and hopefully split those apart if you're looking to increase radii. And if you're looking for a cascade reaction that will generate energy from which you could derive useful uh, work. Release energy from which you could derive useful work. Because you're releasing energy. You're not creating energy from anything. You're releasing energy, binding energy, it's called, because you're unbinding those uh, nuclei. And the energy you release is called the binding energy. That's the energy used to boil water. Well, to create heat, to boil water, to make steam, to blow pinwheels, to generate electricity in nuclear power plants. And on a submarine. How about that? So it's just basically using nuclear energy rather than chemical energy. Chemical energy doesn't change the isotope of the elements involved. It just changes their, uh, what, which one's attached to which one. And that's pr and releases a little bit of energy. Fusion and fission. Well, fission releases a lot more energy than that. A fusion reaction, creating new helium out of old hydrogen, releases even more energy than that per unit. So that's why we want fusion power. That's why technocrats want fusion power, because it will mean a, a huge amount of extra energy will be available for the trouble we take with it, right? And the pollution it'll cause. They, oh, it won't be polluting. I know. Steam wasn't going to pollute. Coal burning wasn't going to pollute. Look how much cleaner it is than wood. I know. I know. Okay? 
burning garbage will be fun. I wonder what the world's going to smell like when the wind changes. So anyway, uh, ask Ethiopia. They have huge garbage fires because we dump a lot of the world's garbage in Ethiopia, other in African nations. Like on the coast of some place, we just drive barges up and dump on their shores. They don't have a big enough military to stop us. That's, that's a, an undeclared war. If, if we do it, I don't know if we personally do it, but other nations do. And that's, you know, that's codified evil. It should not be done. If you have a problem, it isn't some random African nation's problem. It's your problem. Deal with it, or you're a jerk, and your system doesn't work. Move aside, let America in, we'll take care of it. Huh? If you don't like that, then fix it. Okay, so anyway. I'm Eshkelar. I believe in America. Norte America. Because I'm Canadian, see? And we're all one big happy family. At least until they try to uh, institute socialized medicine uh, down below. So anyway. When these larger, denser nuclei in these kelamiting elements, which you can generally call them the three that are most, uh, that are uh, stable enough that you can use them to do work and concentrate them and that they can create a standing magical field that isn't just gone in an instant, um, are uh, Hecatium, Deminsk, and Ephodium. Ephodium, of course, is why we can't make the ephod today, because there's no ephodium left. Just so you guys know, the special crystals no longer exist. We have misidentified them for naturally occurring ones, for other naturally occurring ones that are, that we can find, you know. But the original ephodium is gone forever because it decayed long ago, like any, like uranium would have if uh, this was billions of years we're talking about instead of millions of years. So anyway, so now you have these magical elements and they break down over time. And when they do, they form things that you would recognize, uranium, see, and lead, and other large uranide scale nuclei, which are also unstable and break down over time too. This is what a cascade is. You start with one thing and then it becomes more of something lesser and then it becomes more of something lesser until you break down into stable forms and then that's what we see around us. You know, wood and the trees and the stuff. There are very few unstable elements that are attached to all that stuff because the unstable elements that would break down quickly that are really energetic have already broken down. And the ones that we're seeing, like uranium and whatnot, are the less volatile ones. Just like in an oil field, you know, we have oil bubbling up from the ground come a bubbling crude. Well, that's a real thing. The reason it does is because of pressure. Just like the pressure creates volcanoes. Pressure underground, yeah. And in every oil bed, oil deposit, we don't know this anymore because we don't see it anymore. But in every oil bed and deposit, there is a huge reservoir of lighter volatile substances. Stuff with high vapor pressures. Stuff that would, get this, today we just have tar burbling out of the ground some places. But 10,000 years ago, get this, we still had volatiles coming out of those places. In other words, if there was a lightning strike or a fire anywhere near, you would get a giant flaming torch. Oh yeah. For some people, that would look like something you should worship, like a jan, like a fire spirit. Think about it. An Efreet, a fire spirit. Yeah, a free-willed fire spirit that rules, that rules, that, that roams the desert. And we feed it stuff, and it eats it up right there, it burns it up. It must be a godless worship it. And you guys think that this is all mystical because you don't know what the world was like 10,000 years ago. You weren't there. I was. I didn't like it because I just come from Patchwork, which was a very nice place, let me tell you. But eh, this is my place now, so I'm making the best I can of it by explaining to you why we have myths that don't connect up. They're not all just made up. They're not all just fever dreams or opium dreams. Some are. <laughs> Some of those I passed around. Ah, yeah, I joined a carnival and I was kicking the gong around. If you don't know what that means, you're not Canadian. So. These elements, ephod, deminsk, and, uh, well, ephodium, deminsk, and hecatium, they break down, and as they break down into lesser elements, like uranides and whatnot, they release, amongst other particles, 
they release Kells. These Kells are around the wizard in a standing magical field. They're not in him except in the elements of his makeup. And there are very few magical elements in a human. You know, they're mostly in nature and they break down over time and then you don't see them anymore after four and a half billion years like Earth is. But at three billion years, like Patchwork is, there's still plenty of it. Well, no, I mean like my old campaign. The Western Mark is three billion years so That universe, well, that world, I should say. The universe is about eight billion years. But Patchworld is in a astral socket. It doesn't really... It doesn't belong to any of the quantum universes. It is in a null space between several universes in what we call the astral sea, which is... Uh, which is one form of the matrix which binds all the universes together, keeps them from shuffling around and banging off each other, and co-temporal effects taking place like ghost phenomena. Yeah, it's a thing. Because we're seeing people in other continua, fragments of them, little bits of them. We don't know what that means. They don't know what it means when they see us. Ghosts, visitations, yeah, even monsters. So anyway, now you got all this magic in the background. Well, you can have magical mutations. And a magical mutation of what we would call anthropoid apes created the elves. Just like a radiological mutation of what we call the anthropoid apes created man in, our, in this world, not my world. <laughs> in my world, we're cooler than that. But still, you get the idea. I come from a non-Darwinian continuum. They're not all Darwinian, let me tell you. And none of them is Keynesian. Just so you know, guy's an idiot. So anyway, the elves exist in this magical background. And because of the strength of the magical background, there is a story to the elves. The first part of it is the first generation of elves were born under the veil across the sky. There was day and there was night, but the sun was a smudge and the moon was a blur because the earth and the solar system was traveling through, were, was, traveling through a large molecular cloud. If you ask astrophysicists today, you will find that, yes, indeed, your earth also passed through a very large molecular cloud not long ago. Yeah. And in my continuum, that vast molecular cloud contained in addition, well, bonded to the methane especially because Kel-bearing materials tend to bond to methane. And methane attracts Kells too because they don't affect its composition. They just merely make it a little less stable. So what happens is this giant cloud of methane and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and oxygen. Uh, you can't see me gesturing, but man, I make it all very clear. I'll stop being invisible soon. But at any rate, also were supercharged with magic. So uh, while the solar system and the Earth were in this cloud, not only did the Earth have its own magical minerals releasing magic into the standing magical field, but we were in the middle of a giant wealth of extra sources of magical energy. So the magical energy during the time of the veil across the sky was enormous. And elves woke up. Now we're elves. They didn't know about humans. They didn't know about any of the other of the races. There are seven races of man, but I'll tell you about those another day. They didn't know about them. They only knew about themselves. And for them, it was always night because daylight was just, you know, the sun was a pale smudge in the sky. And the moon was like a blur. So they didn't know anything about the universe until they started using magic to do work, to do what we would use physics for in our world. They use magic to create effects, to allow them to melt metals, to allow them to create composite materials that would allow them to create sensors that would look outside the range of their eyes or the ability to see beyond the veil across the sky to see where it was. And it took thousands of years for some of them, but the story I'm talking about is a 7,500-year story. So it's discreet. When the elves first awoke, first generation of elves woke to the the veil across the sky. And so they operate effectively in the night. Elves are night, night creatures, they're night hominids. That's why their eyes are larger, that's why they have uh, slit pupils that will widen in, uh, 
at night and it's slipped down in the daytime because they are, their eyes are more cat-like. Uh, there, uh, there are other nocturnal primates that have these qualities and also derive more along those lines than humans were. So elves have the third kind of uh, eye. With those rods and cones, there's another kind of cone, I think, that cats have. Elves have those. So anyway, and the elves throve in this high magical environment. So they created magic to a high art. They created wizardry to a high art. They innovated in every way, shape, and form and created civilization based not on technical prowess, not on engineering in our practical sense, but in engineering on the magical level. So they could smelt metals. They could blend things, some things that we can't blend because they could use magic to, to uh, micromanage things and make them all go right. We can't do that in metal. metal metallurgy is a very difficult science because it's not exact. You can't guarantee that your metal will mix evenly. You can't guarantee there will be no bubbles. They have to test these things. They had problems with submarine steel not long ago because the tests weren't covering all the qualities that you needed. And the people doing the tests were like, well, you know what, this is good enough. We don't have to do it. We don't have to worry about it. This is good enough. I mean, we over strengthened things five times. And these are at least two times stronger, so it's okay. And it turned out that it wasn't okay and it was a big scandal. So anyway. Magic can do it better than technology can, but it also requires a different kind of work on the part of the person doing the work. You have to focus magic through your body, create a lens out of your mind through which the magic is focused to do work in the real world. That's called wizardry. Yeah. So instead of using your hands to affect the world, which is what engineers do, you're using your mind to directly affect the world by making a lens out of it rather than hammers and tongs like you do with your hands. You're making a lens out of your eye, your brain. And that's how you focus magic to do work in the world. Now, to do this, the wizard requires a certain peculiar mental focus for any different kind of work he wants to do or she wants to do. You don't just like shout out a bunch of words and something happens. You don't like click your foot and something happens. You have to focus your mind into such a way that it becomes an excellent lens for magic, creating the effect that you want out of it when it gets there. In the process, some of that energy is randomized. Ask a physicist. It's called entropy. It's also called enthalpy if you're in heating and air conditioning. The amount of energy lost from the system, the noise in the system. And that creates heat. And when you create heat inside a wizard's brain, whoops. And that's why there are limits to how much magic a wizard can focus through his or her mind at any given moment. And that's why some wizards, oh, and over time you get better at it. Your body becomes adapted to it to a small extent. So great wizards can cast spells of higher uh, Kel density. You know, what we call higher level spells. And lesser wizards will never get there. Because if they try, they'll burn their brains out. You know, I cast a small spell. I cast a spell one finger. It shoots a bolt of energy from the end of my finger. And that bolt of energy hits something. It's about enough to kill a pigeon. Okay? I mean, here in the real world, I could just about kill a pigeon with a spell bolt. But it, it would have del deleterious concentra uh, effects on me, side effects. And here's one of them. Back in my old campaign where everything was super magical, right? You could cast a spell, one bolt, uh, a one finger, I mean. I could cast a one finger that would drill through half a mountain. And it would raise my blood temperature about a full degree Fahrenheit to do so. So I could throw one finger, and, man, do a lot of damage. But if I missed, I'd have to throw another one, wouldn't I? And another one, and another one. Well, every time I do that, it's raising my blood temperature one degree. You physical doctors out there, you, you uh, practical MDs out there, huh? How many degrees can I heat my blood up before I start getting woozy? Because that's called a fever. And did you know the people with a high rate of fever? They tend to get really woozy. Yeah, they go into delirium. They pass out. They could die. 
And so this is a practical limit to wizardry, if you understand what I'm saying here. Because if I cast a spell that's five times as powerful as a first level spell, right? What I would call a fifth level spell, it would also be called, let's see, that's a lower Shalimar. No, that's an upper Pachia. Uh, an upper Pachia five and six, you say. Yeah. Well, no, it's zero one is the Thotek knot, and then uh, two and three is the uh, Nactar web, and then uh, four and five is the Pachia wheel. Yeah, so the, so the five is fifth level spell is the high Pachia. It's got five times as much Kel density in the work that you do, uh, and it also heats your blood up a lot. I would heat my blood up five degrees casting one, a uh, high pack to you. And uh, try casting two of those and I'll die right there on my feet. So there is a practical limit to wizardry. And elves make excellent wizards because they are adapted to magic. They lived in a higher magical ambience when they were young. And so magic doesn't affect them nearly as much as it affected me, say, because I came from a later generation where there was a lot less magic in the world. And so for them, that would be a trifle. But for me, it would be a major spell that popped my brain. And that's about the elves again. Let's go back here. We're in the veil across the world. We're in a giant molecular cloud that's full of magic, supercharged with magic. And all the elves are magical as hell, right? Well, the solar system gets toward the edge of that cloud, starts thinning out. Over 10, you know, over, I think it was 3,000 years ago. And at that time, magic started dropping away in the world. And that first generation of elves started losing power. And they didn't know why. They had to do all this research, of course, and they figured it out. They are like, whoa, we're going to run out of energy and we will no longer be elves because we need magic in the background for us to be practically immortal and to be able to do the things we do that are amazing and unbelievable. At least according to them, you know. And this is important to note. The elves were a society. And so everything elven was wrapped up and bound with magic. The wines, the food, the books, the stories, the songs. All of it magical as hell. So if you weren't magical, it seemed like... It seemed like irrational to you. You wouldn't understand an elf. Because you couldn't. Because half the references they make would be about magical things and those effects, and you wouldn't get them. So it was a difficult thing. If you drank an elven wine, it might taste flat, rotten berries. But if an elf drank an elven wine, he or she could tell the day, the date, the mix, the history of that vineyard. See what I mean? These are the things that are wrapped up in the elven society, which do not come through to the non-magical, and that's the problem with what happened to the elves. As the solar system moved out of the veil across the sky, the sun appeared as an object, not just a blur. Boy, that caused a war. People started worshipping it, you can imagine. And the moon started to appear as a smudge now, instead of just a pale blur across the sky. And they're like, wait, the sun is a real thing? It was a blur. And this was a smudge. And now this is getting bright. <gasps> it's a thing, too. Of course, they started investigating the universe. Now they knew there was one out there. They used magic to investigate the universe. They learned a lot about it. But they discovered that they could not do as much of it magically. They had to use magic to do technological things now. So instead of just creating a magical telescope, you know, like cr creating a spell that would, cr would focus your mind into creating a telescope sticking out in front of your face and you would use it as long as you want and then it would dissolve back into the, you know, the ethereum or whatever, into random, randomicity. Um, you would need instead magic to generate the molten metal to make sure there were no bubbles in it, the quality control, the, the ability to, to attach things that are too small for your eye to see, the ability to create a lens that lets you see beyond the microscopic so you can make perfect. And also to do something at that level takes thousands of years because you're doing one after another after another. You're making molecular bonds. A human couldn't do it, we could not. And we couldn't see that far, it would take you know, technology. Well, the elves had technology based on magic. And so there were elven castles, but they were based on magical construction techniques, not our practical ones. So if the magic went out of the world, they would become unstable, see? Just like elves would become unhealthy. And so as magic went from the world, as the earth and the sun started to move out from this 
uh, stand, this giant molecular cloud, the old elves got weak and it triggered a mating impulse. They had never mated for progeny, ever. They'd never felt the need. They were immortal. An immortal being doesn't need to procreate. There's no need to carry its code along, its beauty along, because it will physically carry its own heritage with it. So now that they were no longer going to be immortal, however, the elves were stimulated into a mating frenzy, so to speak, not like the one on Star Trek. And from this came the second generation of elves. The second generation of elves understand humanity because they, at least started to in those days, because there were wizards too by then. You know, humans had awoke, dwarves had awoke. So now there were other races after 3,000 years, right? And they were all meeting each other, you know, and the civilizations were fighting and warring and, and blending and whatever, and half-breeds and all this. And so, because they're all humanoids, you know, so they're all able to mate, not all interbreed, but certainly all had the same mating equipment and roughly similar pheromones, right? The elves were bound to be magic. So, so that's different. But at any rate, the second generation of elves became uh, minor masters of magic and minor masters of non-magic technology. So they were able to use magic effectively to create a more practical technology that we would understand today. Just using magical methods. That's what we see in the movies about magic, right? Oh, it's just like the world, except they're using magic to heat the metal, they're using magic. See what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's what the second generation of elves did. Very practical. Uh, wizards, warlocks, engineers, clockmakers. They all came from the elves. They made these beautiful artifacts. They, the first generation of elves made these beautiful, brilliant, last forever artifacts using magical construction techniques. The second generation of elves did it using practical engineering. Even though there was some magic bound in it, mostly you would use magic to power something. And you no longer use magic as the parts themselves because elves couldn't work magic that way anymore. The first generation could have, but now they were weak and old. They were getting old. So eventually, the magic became so low uh, compared to how it had been in the veil across the sky that the first generation of elves had to leave or die. And many of them wasted away and died. There are stories about the tragedies. But the second generation of elves was happy as clams. Now they had the cosmos was opening up. They could see the brighter stars. They could see the sun and the moon and some of the planets. And man, they're learning so much more than their grandfathers and uh, their fathers and them. Uh, see what I mean? But they were losing their father's tradition of magic, and easy magic use, the ability to levitate anywhere, the ability to fly through the air. They didn't have that anymore. You know, they had some magic, throw a fireball. But it was nothing like raising a tsunami, you know, which is what the first generation elves could do. And so anyway, we would call them titans now. So the second generation elves was going great guns, and but then that cloud we were traveling out of it, it was getting thinner and thinner and thinner and the basic ambience of magic was dropping down to that which only the Earth's natural ambience could sustain. That's very small compared to that huge molecular cloud we were traveling through where all the magical beasts were happy and the elves were happy. And all. Well now we emerge into the full daylight, whack, and it's horrible. It's all the magical creatures are now like pining away and going to die, even the ones from the second generation because there's not enough magic to sustain them. But, look, the whole universe is open. We have all the stars to look at. Yeah, but we're all dying. What are we going to do? By now, the first generation of elves has escaped through dimensional portals to younger universes, other times and places. But the second generation of elves is starting to pine away, too. Now, they're going to stabilize at a point because they can live without magic or with a very low magical ambience if they have to. But they won't be as powerful as they once were. That's why in my campaign you would find ancient towers inhabited by ancient wizards that you could beat. How could you do that? Well, they had been, become very weak over time. And herein lies the tale. The elves, of course, as I was pointing out earlier, they specialized. They would walk away from the world. I'm going to become the world's greatest clockmaker, and my clocks will be like none other. That would absorb you so much it would take 10,000 years to make a clock. And so in the, in the 6,000 years I'm talking about, 7,000 years I'm talking about, you would never appear again. You would be lost. And sometimes you would ignore your body. And so uh, I, in my adventuring career in the Buster Mark, would come upon old elves that had frozen in time. 
They just sat there doing something for so long that there was a mummy sitting at the table, still engaged. The wizards among them, some of them became liches because they kept ignoring, I'm not hungry, throw a spell. I'm not tired, throw a spell. Throw a spell, throw a spell. And then eventually they became powered by magic. So they had to stay underground where the magic was still strong. By the way, because Earth emits its own magic now, that means that the magic is emitted by decaying elements, and those are deep in the earth because they're denser than the ones we know. The metals are denser, so the most are very deep. Now, around volcanoes and stuff, there's higher magical concentration. But generally, the earth is the lava flows contain magical minerals that slowly break down and release kelvins of the atmosphere or into the you know standing kel field, standing magical field. And that's the energy you use for doing magic. And the price you pay is it heats your blood up when you do it. And if you throw too much too often, you break your blood down and you die. Or you get very ill. You know. And if you throw a bunch of heavy spells to kill all the orcs, hey, the orcs at the back are like, look, that guy just fell over. He's steaming. Let's walk up and see if he's good to eat. Say, that's how that works. That's why there aren't many great wizards and why the great wizards have fallen. And this is, explains all of that. That's so why I'm trying to explain this to you guys. I know it's a ridiculously long lecture for me. I'm sorry. But, you know, I'm all high. It's a nice day. So, now that the magic was even trailing away farther, the second generation of elves became worried, and that sparked another mating frenzy. Again, the frenzy might take place between consenting adults. I'm not saying that they were killing people over it, but still. The elves that came from that, reun that union, the third generation of elves, were called the Empty Ones because they had no magic. Think about it. You're an elf. You're born in a world to which your grandparents were completely, totally accustomed and it became so hostile they were forced to flee or die. That world was so suffused with magic that everything elven, all of elven culture, the wines, the foods, the songs, the stories, the histories, is so wrapped up in magic that if you're not half a wizard yourself, you don't get it. It's like they're speaking in a pigeon language and you only understand part of the words. Exactly like that. You can't taste the wine. You don't know why they think it's so good. You don't know why they search for things to the point where they distraction, where they'll deny themselves because you don't understand the rewards. You can't. You're not magical. Think about that. So that third generation of elves called the Empty Ones had to find some other raison d'etre. They had to find some other reason to live, to exist. They weren't magical. They weren't wrapped in magic or the, or the fluid combination of magic and technology like the second generation. They weren't wrapped in magic like the first generation. They were empty. They had nothing. And so, to look for something to do, they either specialized again and became craftsmen that would work on one-in-a-lifetime magnificent things, you know, whether they sold them or not, or they would go to the land of men. They would go to the world of men. They would hang with men and younger races and quick living races, races that were always in a hurry, always doing something, always, always, always. It's so much fun. Give you something to do every day. Look at how old he get. Wow, I lost my friend, I have to make new friends. Look at how different everything is every century or so. And that, just like an obsession with a craft, could keep an elf alive obsessed with the changing of the times in the human, in the mortal existence. The problem with that is, once an elf becomes too familiar with mortality, the elf tends to attach himself or herself to mortality and gradually age and fade and die, just like mortals do, but over an immensely longer period of time. 3,000 years it took for the first generation to lose so much magic around them that they were forced to breed. 3,000 years it took again for the second generation to be part of the generation that totally left all that magic and just had the little bit that the earth had. And then they were forced into breeding and then created the third generation that had no magic. Even though the earth was still magical, they just weren't magical sensitive. And so you could have human wizards who were nothing like the first generation of elves. You could laugh at them, you know. And you could have human wizards that wouldn't seem powerful compared to the ancient elves of the second generation, 3,000 years of that, simply because those elves were powerful in comparison, but compared to their parents of the first generation, they were nothing. See what I mean? So, 
my friend Drano, the elf, who also made it to Patchworld, he survived the cataclysm and uh, the unkind eating our universe. And uh, he was born of the third generation of elves. He was an empty one. So for him, magic meant nothing. He couldn't taste the wines. He couldn't taste the cookies. You know, elven Christmas cookies are to die for. And uh, Drona would eat when it's like, I'd rather have a Lembus, you know. And so, and even Lembus tasted him like matzo because, you know, he had none of the elven flair. He had none of the magical flair of, of all the intricacies of its uh, dietary um, construction and its ability to make maintain perfect flavor by changing the density of the flavors as you move through it. That's why Lembas are so incredible, because they're magical. Well, Drona's not magical, Drano, whatever his name is. He's not magical. So for him, that was like, bah, bah, eating chalk. So he became enamored of the world of humans. He joined with the world of humans. He joined with adventurers and opened up the world to new civilizations, to, to find the ancient ruins that had been left abandoned when all the old monsters died or hid deep in the earth so that they wouldn't. And so he encountered things that even the first generation had not encountered. Of course, not as powerful, maybe, but still dread deadly and dreadful. And in the bowels of the earth. Yeah. And that was, I did that too, you know. I wasn't with him, I was with the Empress, because <laughs> I was cool. He was just some guy, adventuring with a bunch of guys, you know. But uh, they, eh, you know, but I was, <laughs> I was the Empress's right hand, well, sort of. I was one of the, her group of young up-and-comers back then. Yeah, that's back when I was, I don't know, 800 years old, 1,000 years old. And uh, that's where I met Drano, because he was a part of this other group that were not exactly competing because the Empress was the Empress. You know, she owned 13 cities plus the big stink. And, you know, and they were sludge falls. They were like a small community, you know. So they were lucky and made some dragon friends. So, you know, we had them. You know, the Empress had them in, in jails down below. She had plenty of dragons, but they weren't willing. <laughs> That's what the sludge fall guys said, willing dragons. Well, he did that. Heck, I offer to smoke joints with dragons. They still try to eat me. I don't. I never tried to eat a dragon. They ate a few with lightning bolts. <laughs> oh, they don't like that. So anyway, so Drano came to the world of men, and where if he had stayed in the world of elves, he would have eventually aged, not at all. He would have been immortal, and some day some adventurer would have found him, frozen in time. You know, with big icicles or dust hanging from him and uh, cobwebs and stuff uh, in the midst of like some activity he was doing and you know, whatever his favorite thing was. And I forget what Drano was into. I'm pretty sure he liked human women. Then he liked human beer. There's something else he was into. Oh, yeah. His compensation for being completely unmagical because it was traumatizing that whole generation. Many of them went crazy and died. Became adventurers and died. You know, uh, tried to conquer territories full of men and died. <laughs> One elf against 10,000 men. It's not as fair as you'd think. So anyway, and so he too became semi-mortal and he aged over time. He lost all his hair. You know, I mean on top. He still had his beard and stuff, but he no longer looked as elfin. You couldn't see his elfin heritage in him because as he got older and he got more mortal, he looked more like a regular man and less like an elf. Elves are very easy to tell apart from you as they glow. If, if you see one, you would know. As a matter of fact, the angels in the Bible, they might well have been elves because they look so much like humans that the people in Sodom and Gomorrah didn't know the difference, did they? Yeah, until they like uncloaked and showed their full glory. <laughs> and elves could do that too, especially the first generation. But the second generation too. The third generation, no, they're a bunch of putzes, except Drano compensated. He went and found this guy named, what was his name, Kaladax, he was a traitor. And Kaladax was a psychic guy. He was like a psionic power. You know, he could like bend spoons, but better than that. He could um, levitate and he could uh, create a bubble of air around himself and go underwater for a short period of time. He could do stuff that, you know, Usually it takes wizardry to do, but he did it with psychic powers that were all his own. And they also heat up your blood. That's a problem. But the difference is, Kaladex 
could walk into an area that had been specially shielded against magic and so there was no magic in it and it wouldn't bother him at all and could still do all his little tricks without it no wizard could now i could do that too I, right now i'm psionically invisible but it's not a great power of mine my great powers are magical powers and the altering reality abilities of my uh, of my ring uh, what is your name oh barizanor right, that's his name i keep forgetting and now i got five rings you know i'm sort of a five ring circus but the other four never talk uh, barizanor is the only one that talks i wonder why oh well he'll tell me if he wants me to know but so that's what happened to my friend Drano. He came from the most intense magical ambiance ever. And then he was without magic himself. And so he sought the world of humans. And he became a fighter in the world of humans. And learned that he had the talent for psionic powers from this Kaladex guy. He's lucky he had the power, the ability to do it. He didn't know if he had it or not, but he had the latent ability. All humanoids have the latent ability to perform what you guys would call psychic powers, but are really very simple. Telekinesis, aerokinesis, mondokinesis, acceleration. If you can do any of these things, you'll already know you can. And you're already hiding it from people, because if you don't, the CIA, the GRU, whoever it is, they're going to dissect you and try to make their boys like that. And that'll be the end of you. <laughs> yes or no? Come on now, fess up. Yeah, I know. Uh, we're doing it for the security of our country. Yeah. That's why Mounties wear red. Because that way all the girls know where the guys with the big honkers are. <laughs> ah, well, anyway, getting back to my story. So Drano became semi-mortal. And the last time I saw him, doggone, he had white hair. You know, on the sides. His balls and egg on top. And his beard was going white. I never saw that on an elf before. So... Yeah, and he's, let's see, it was, it was about a thousand years he was uh, in the Western Mark. You know, he was the third generation, and then it got destroyed, and he came to Patchworld. So he's right now about 1,500 years old. And compared to the elves of the first and second generation, he looks more like he's 3,000 years old. So he's aging rapidly compared to elves. But he's happy as a stone. Because he gets this changing panoply of human stories every day, every week, every month. And as an elf, he can remember most of it. That's scary. Elves remember stuff. Oh, I wouldn't want to remember that. Oh. So anyway, that's the story. That's what an origin story takes. You can't just begin and say, here is my buddy Drano. He's a great swordsman, and he's a psionic superman. So he floats through the air, and you can hit him with a fireball, and he can just bat it out of the way. He can take an elephant being dropped on him because his body focuses all its psionic power right there at the impact to keep him from being hurt by it. It's a reflect, a reflexive thing. It's called mondokinesis. It's the ultimate psionic power. I can't do it, but I have the ring. Barizanar keeps me alive. Or at least he heals me. At least he did. It's not magical enough around here anymore. If I go here, I'm done. And Barizanar will probably leave me or else one of you guys will find a ring in my apartment and you'll put it on. And Barizanar, who is a fully autonomous, super-powered entity from a faraway camp, from a faraway universe, may decide he likes you. And he'll do for you what he did for me. Keep you alive through all kinds of stuff. Bring you back if you die. Or, if he doesn't like you, he has a full pattern of Eshkalar. And most people that put him on when I've been killed or dis, you know, disemboweled or I'm disappeared for a while they become Eshkalar <laughs> and then I'm back oh so if you find Barizanar don't just put him on you know what I mean talk to him for a while put him on your dresser and just kind of talk to him let him get to know you don't just put him on right away you know what I'm saying okay well, this is Eshkalar telling you about how complex an origin story can be the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to tell you mine next this has been another Eshkalar moment, another A Brief History of Wizard Time. Thank you and good night.